Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out to the MultiCoin Summit and for your continued support. My name is Spencer Applebaum, and I'm a partner on the investment team here at MultiCoin. Today, I'm going to talk through how we're thinking about value capture and defensibility for DeFi protocols. For those of you who've been following the space closely over the last 12 to 24 months, it's become increasingly clear that trust has been eroded in centralized finance, otherwise known as CeFi. Poor risk management practices at several of these large institutions ended up leading to their demise, and unknowing end users were ultimately harmed. Every CeFi company that you see listed on this slide behind me was a winner during the bull run, but because they were all reliant on human judgment and not Web3 smart contracts, not one of them exists today. With that being said, DeFi projects, both on the lending and derivative side, such as Aave, Compound, MakerDAO, UXD, and others, held up exceptionally well during the 2022 market turbulence. They faced the same stress test that the rest of the market faced last year, and all things considered, they actually operated fairly smoothly. Because we have real-time insights into on-chain data, we can see that all of these protocols both remain solvent and timely liquidated any users who are approaching negative equity. As we think about DeFi and CeFi internally at MultiCoin, our general conclusion is that DeFi is better in every aspect. DeFi is transparent, as I mentioned on the previous slide, meaning any user can review the solvency of a protocol that she's using on a real-time basis and adjust her positions accordingly. DeFi is non-custodial, meaning that all users control the private keys to the funds the entire time, thereby eliminating counterparty risk. DeFi is permissionless, so anyone anywhere in the world can participate, which we think is market expansionary. It's also composable, meaning that any application developer can seamlessly integrate two DeFi applications with one another. And lastly, we think that DeFi should structurally be cheaper than CeFi because there's very little overhead associated with running a DeFi project. Though we think DeFi products have a larger market opportunity, one acute challenge that we've recognized being a DeFi investor is that CeFi products have stronger structural moats. Stringent licensing requirements, big customer support teams, expensive servers and custody systems, high performance matching engines, human-based risk management, and more, all require significant upfront capital that a lot of startups are just not able to afford. In DeFi land, however, anyone can simply fork an AMM exchange contract like Uniswap or create a borrow-lend protocol with similar collateral and liquidation management rules that Aave and Compound have. So in this slide and the next, we wanted to show the disparity to give you some helpful context. So per Coinbase's financial statements, you can see they spent just shy of $6 billion in operating expenses in 2022. On the contrary, MakerDAO, which is one of the leading DeFi protocols, spent only $46 million. In summary, it's far easier and cheaper to build a DeFi protocol than it is to operate a regulated exchange or lending business. Because there's very little structural moat for any DeFi protocol, one question that we think both developers and investors need to obsess over is, how can DeFi tokens actually capture sustainable and lasting value? Our original thesis for value capture in DeFi centered around the idea that protocols with unforkable state would be able to capture value, whereas those without unforkable state would be unable to do so. And I guess that statement kind of naturally begs the question of what is unforkable state? A simple way to understand it is to compare two well-known DeFi protocols, Uniswap and ZeroX. Let's start with Uniswap. If I fork Uniswap v3 tomorrow and create a new protocol called Multiswap, the contracts would work the exact same way. However, there wouldn't be billions of dollars deposited into Multiswap AMMs like there is on Uniswap today. More capital in the Uniswap AMM means lower slippage for takers and thus a better overall trading experience. Now let's look at the 0x example. 0x is not an AMM exchange, and thus it doesn't hold any assets or any TVL. After processing a trade, the state of the 0x asset swap contract remains virtually unchanged, and that's why you can see the blue line on the bottom there at zero. 
So from this example, I hope you can kind of see how Uniswap does have unforkable state, but 0x does not. For the early years of DeFi, we thought unforkable state would be a strong moat and enable DeFi tokens to capture value. However, we've come to believe that that thesis has been invalidated. We've now come to appreciate that unforkable state doesn't account for the ephemeral nature of capital and users in DeFi systems. On top of that, aggregators ensure that capital is routed efficiently across all of the various DeFi protocols. Our view is that if a user is sophisticated enough to onboard into DeFi as it stands today with all of its clunky UX, she'll likely be able to search for best execution if she's a trader, uh, best yield if she's a lender, lowest borrowing cost if she's a borrower, et cetera. These platforms are just not super sticky, and really one of the primary benefits of crypto and Web3 more broadly is that capital is extremely fast moving and fluid on chain. In the next few slides, we're going to take a look at a few examples of the fluidity of capital on chain in the wild. Our first example is capital rotations across chains on just a one year time horizon. We can see that Polygon was dominant just 12 months ago, but in that time, Base and StarkNet have both started eating into its market share in pretty quick succession. We use fees paid in this chart because we find that to be one of the best metrics of real demand across all of the various blockchain ecosystems. Our second example is capital rotations across NFT marketplaces. So in 2021, OpenSea was the dominant venue for secondary NFT trading. However, a new marketplace called Blur came along and completely usurped them by offering zero fees and catering to large traders. They went so far as to offer NFT creators full royalties for blocking OpenSea from listing their assets. Our last example is capital rotations across DeFi protocols themselves. Uniswap versions one and two had only one fee tier, which was 30 basis points. Later, for V3, they introduced the idea of variable fee tier pools, and from that, a one basis point fee pool was created for the USDC USDT pair. From that one fee change alone, Uniswap went from 10% market share of one inch aggregator volume, which is the largest aggregator for USDC USDT, up to 65% market share in just a matter of days. Again, I think this shows how fast capital flows can respond to prices on chain. One really interesting study we found that was done by Alistor, one of the Uniswap Foundation grantees, concluded that only 13% of Uniswap's taker volume in Q3 of 2022 originated from the Uniswap front end. On the contrary, almost 70% came from either aggregators or MEV bots. All of that volume is inherently algorithmic and just looking for best execution. The result of this is that none of those traders or that volume has any brand loyalty to Uniswap whatsoever. Rather, they'll simply go wherever the best price is. I think this slide does a really good job of showing that even for the largest brand in DeFi, which is Uniswap, only a small fraction of their users are actually owned by the Uniswap front end. Said another way, brand loyalty in DeFi is a myth and best execution is king. Because capital is so fluid in DeFi, the presence of unforkable state doesn't necessarily mean that a token should capture value. And again, let's look at Uniswap as an example. The protocol has over $3 billion of quote, unforkable state, and liquidity providers, again, I'm specifically referring to LPs here, not to be confused with uni token holders, have earned $2.6 billion in fees from Uniswap since January of 2021. That's the blue line you see on this slide. However, zero of those dollars have ever flowed to uni token holders because Uniswap's DAO has never turned on the fee switch. That's the pink line and the sad unicorn you see on the bottom right. For some historical context, most DeFi protocols turn on fees shortly after mainnet to fund all of their treasury and growth initiatives. Yet Uniswap has never done that. Our theory on this is that the Uniswap community recognizes that capital is extremely fluid and fast moving on chain, and they also recognize they don't have a whole lot of brand loyalty. 
As a result, they don't want to risk LPs leaving because they turn on the fee switch and cut into their margins, which as we saw earlier uh, from Jerry and Kyle, they're already losing a ton of money. So in exploring the investability of UniToken, or rather the lack thereof, we realized that protocols needed other ways to capture value beyond unforkable state. That led us to our new thesis, which we call protocols don't capture value, DAOs manage risk. The basic premise of our new thesis is that certain types of DeFi protocols have inherent risk associated with them. Owners of these protocols' native tokens are primarily responsible for governing that risk and ensuring that the protocol remains solvent. They also take on the risk of being diluted or slashed in the event that there's some sort of shortfall. For managing the system and taking on the risk of there being an insolvency, those token holders must be compensated. So we think there's a common trope amongst Web3 investors that all DeFi governance tokens are created equal. However, we think we've identified a unique type of DeFi governance token that we internally call a risk-bearing token. Governance tokens and risk-bearing tokens on the surface look extremely similar. Via on-chain voting, both types of tokens govern the protocol's parameters, allocate the protocol's treasury, and instruct general protocol development. But one type of token manages risk, and the other does not. Risk-bearing tokens do everything that regular DeFi governance tokens do, but they also have the unique quality of being a backstop in the event of a protocol risk failure, bad liquidation, net shortfall, et cetera. So in the next slide, we're gonna take a look at an example of the difference between the two types of tokens. The best and most obvious comparison, I think, is to look at Uniswap's Uni token versus MakerDAO's MKR token, which are the native tokens of two of the largest DeFi protocols. While Uni does perform a few governance functions, such as which AMM curves to support, the various fee tiers across all of their pools, and how to allocate the Uniswap treasury, the token doesn't manage or backstop any risk in the system whatsoever because there's no risk to manage. There are simply spot assets that sit in an AMM for takers to trade against. If the fee switch for UniToken was turned on, it would be strictly value extractive on a per transaction basis. UniToken holders would contri contribute absolutely nothing to the experience or the profitability of makers and takers on Uniswap, otherwise known as their users. So now let's consider Maker, the issuer of the DAI stablecoin. The Maker protocol allows users to post crypto assets, like wrap Bitcoin and ETH, as collateral and borrow their unique DAI stablecoin against it. In effect, Maker is a lending facility and offers their users leverage. MKR holders are the final backstop in the event that the Maker lending facility becomes insolvent. They actually take on the risk that they'll be diluted in the event that Maker has bad debt. This mechanism has, in fact, been used in the past in the wake of March 2020, when MakerDAO had to auction off newly minted MKR tokens to cover a protocol shortfall that was created by Black Thursday. MKR holders have always faced the risk of dilution, and as such, those MKR holders have a right to extract fees out of the system to rightfully compensate them for backstopping all of Maker's users. So we've talked in the last few slides about our thesis on managing risk, and I think it naturally begs the question of, why is DAO risk management so important? There have been several historical examples of crises in DeFi, and one very recently. That recent example came in the Aave ecosystem. So Michael Igoroff, the founder of the Curve Protocol, pledged a bunch of his CRV tokens as collateral on Aave to borrow stablecoins against them. After the Aave smart contract exploit, which admittedly was external to the Aave system, the value of his CRV collateral on Aave started to plummet. There was a real risk that Aave would have bad debt on their hands. If you follow crypto Twitter, or spend too much time on it like I do, you would have seen talk about the Aave staking module, aka their insurance fund, as a backstop in the case there was any bad debt caused by Igoroff's leverage. In our view, the existence of that insurance fund and how big and liquid the Aave token is prevented a complete run on the bank from all of Aave's lenders. Aave token holders ensured the system would stay solvent 
and most importantly, gave all of Aave's lenders and borrowers confidence that it would remain solvent. And as such, business continued as usual. Uh, on top of that, I'm happy to report that as of two days, Michael's leverage on Aave is gone, and so they survived the crisis successfully. Taking that one step further, a compelling second order effect of our managing risk framework is that larger protocols that employ native risk bearing tokens with high market caps and ample liquidity benefit from economies of scale. As an example, let's imagine that a new team forks Aave and creates a new borrow lend protocol called Lend Protocol. Importantly, let's assume that Lend Protocol's creators are extremely well capitalized and are able to seed the system with billions of dollars of TVL that matches Aave's TVL. If both Aave token and Lend token manage risk in their respective ecosystems, Aave is likely to be the better venue for lenders. And why is that? Because the Aave token has achieved a level of market cap and liquidity that's hard for Lend token and other new tokens to replicate, it actually serves as a better backstop for their borrow Lend system. This creates a powerful flywheel in which the largest platform with the token that's the most liquid and has the highest market cap is able to attract users because it's perceived to be the safest. These new users bring capital, revenue, TVL, et cetera, which in an equal economic equilibrium increases the platform's native token price, further reinforcing that flywheel that you see on the slide. So we've talked about a lot of theory here, and so in this slide we wanted to look at which types of DeFi protocols we believe manage risk versus those that don't really have a need to. If you look at examples from CeFi, companies like Binance, BitMEX, Deribit, and others, have long touted their large insurance funds as a way to entice derivatives traders to trade there. DeFi derivatives exchanges are no different. They're the protocols that offer the most amount of leverage and thus manage a ton of risk. On top of that, lending protocols, both under collateralized and collateralized, provide leverage, and thus they must also manage that risk. On the other side of the coin, protocols like spot AMMs, yield aggregators, launch pads, on-chain asset management funds, and others don't employ any notion of leverage whatsoever and thus don't have any risk management needs. The tokens of these protocols are, when they collect fees, quite value extractive. So while managing risk is one way to capture value and you know, we think it's probably the best, we're not dogmatic in thinking it's the only approach. We do recognize there are other ways protocols can retain a moat and capture value. We continue to look for new flavors of structural sources of compounding for DeFi protocols, and we do have some ideas there around off-chain state and protocols whose primary products or assets in and of themselves think uh, like Lido, Stake, ETH, or Makers, DAI. I'd be happy to chat more about those ideas at any time today around the summit. In conclusion, our protocols don't capture value, DAO's managed risk thesis, has informed our investment strategy both on the hedge fund and venture fund sides of our business. It's why we're particularly excited about things like lending protocols, derivatives DEXs, CDP stablecoins, and DeFi prime brokerages, but generally we shy away from things like yield aggregators, spot AMMs, and launch pads. Thank you all so much for your attention today, and up next we'll have Cheyenne on stage to explore new frontiers for DeepIn Networks.